So then today we are going to co continue with the um, asymptotic analysis of n estimators. And to remind you what we did last time, so we had these um, um, uh, the setting was we observe IID um, data from um, some underlying distribution um, for a particular parameter, uh, which we assume it's one of the parameters of the parametric model that we assume. And then we um, form these um, optimization-based estimators. So. Um, this class forms some sort of an empirical average of these um, um, m theta as applied to x size, and then uh, that would give you an estimator or a, a, a rule to to obtain estimators based on any number of samples. And um, then you study the, the performance asymptotically. So the idea is that this simplifies um, um, a lot of the discussions. Uh, about risk and stuff, um, things would simplify it. So the first thing that we looked at is the consistency. So what happens um, as n goes to infinity uh, in the vector like zeroth order? So does the sequence converge to the true parameter? And convergence here is in convergence in probability. I'm oh, sorry. Um, convergence probability. And um, we showed that, um, so, so, so the, the prototypical example of consistency is the weak of large numbers. If you have x1 up to xn from some distribution, you form the sample average, the sample average converges in probability to the population average. The population average is some sort of a parameter of the distribution, so mean of the distribution. You're actually estimating that um, parameter and this, like the side notes, you can think of this as a parametric, not non parametric model. So P varies over the class of all possible probability distributions. And this is like G theta. So our theta is actually the distribution. This mean is just the mean of the distribution. So if you assume that the class of all probability distributions that we consider it all, all those that have means, so there's like a finite first moment. That would be a non parametric family of distributions. You can assume as your underlying model, one of them is generating the data. And this estimator is sort of a non parametric estimate. So, estimates the mean, um, not necessarily any parametric form for, for the family. So, this converges to the, the desired parameter. So, the actual parameter that's generating the data, or the mean of the parameter that's generating the data, which is actually the probability distribution. So this, this means that the sample mean is consistent for population mean. It's a, it's a, like a simple rephrasing of the weak law of large numbers using uh, statistical language. So weak law of large number is, uh, from a statistical perspective, a consistency of statement. So a particular estimator is consistent for a particular parameter. And then we, um, using uh, the techniques that we developed, especially the idea of um, uniform convergence, we saw that if we um, assume that the sequence of functions, uh, which, which I'm calling m, n, uh, m sub n of theta, converges to um, the population mean uh, uniformly in probability, um, then we get consistency of the m estimator, sort of. This plus, um, uh, like, almost the uniqueness of the maximizers of uh, the of the maximizer of the population function. So this argument that we did, so at every point, these sample averages converge to the corresponding sample average. So this is equal to large number. So pointwise convergence of the sequence of functions to that target function is there by equal of large numbers. If we can upgrade it to uniform convergence that we saw that good things happen. Uh, so in particular, if you have uniform convergence and then this technical criteria that basically saying that uh, uh, there's a unique maximum at the population level, which is also pretty different the rest, then uh, the hard max of this, which is gonna be your estimator, is gonna converge to the um, arg max of M, which is, which is um, hopefully your true parameter. So this doesn't, Assume any sort of statistical model or whether theta not is the true parameter, but oftentimes 
um, the parameter that max so in these cases that I form mn like that uh, the parameter that maximizes this is going to be the true parameter so we, we looked at what this looks like this uh, population function for the uh, MLE and um, it sort of looks like the KL divergence the negative of the KL divergence between uh, the density at the, the true parameter versus the density of the generic parameter. Um, and because of Jensen's inequality, this quantity and theta is going to be always less than or equal to zero, because the theta is going to be bigger than or equal to zero. And equality holds if and only if the two densities are equal. So um, we're essentially like establishing that theta naught is um, the unique maximizer if the model is identifiable. So if the model is identifiable, means, it means that um, so if the model is not identifiable, then we don't have a unique maximizer because I could have like a, um, another parameter like theta one, uh, whose distance to this is zero. So I could have two different parameters that give me the same density. And then this would be zero. So this would be another um, candidate for the limit to converge. So we can't we can prove consistency. So identifiability is uh, like a necessary condition. Um, but but assuming that you have identifiability, if you make it a little bit strong, uh, stronger, uh, such that you guaranteed well separation as well, then uh, you would have you would have your consistency result. And so, in exponential families, usually these um, KL divergences when you calculate them, they're pretty um, interesting. So they're related to Bergman divergence uh, associated with that. Um, log partition function. And so you can directly verify that oftentimes uh, they do have this property. So they're oftentimes sort of uh, strictly convex, um, like the, the underlying functions, the log partition function is strongly convex. And so good things happen for these. Um, I'm not going to go into detail so you can verify, for example, this is for the exponential case um, that gives you the Itakura Sato distance that we very early on looked at when we talked about risk. So uh, the K divergence in these exponential families is a source of these interesting pseudo distances. Okay, so that's that. Any questions about that? Yeah. So I'm just the, the last bit of this. It's all quite good. So it's like identifiability leads to unique maximization, which is slightly unexpected and inconsistent. Um, okay. Like identifiability leads to. Um, Yes, you can say and if it leads to this having a unique maximizer. Um, that's not exactly enough. You need a little bit more. First, you need uniform conversions, which you have to establish elsewhere. And you also need that that all separation business. Does right. Very identifiability like have like a it'll show up in the same places that you'll get. Uniform convergence, right? Because like, like if the space is too big, might not like I don't know if might be easier to lose, right? So like, you're gonna lose two parameters. Um, I probability is more like related to like how you parameterize things, mm -hmm. not not um. So the space being big sort of affects this guy, affects this uh, uniform convergence. So this could fail if your space is too big. Uh, so if this space is compact, so all these other things, the space is compact. Like uniform convergence sort of reduces to something reasonable. And if the state is compact and it's continuous, then the second condition also reduces to unique maximize. But um, identifiability is more like related to how you parameterize. So there is this um, um, you might be able to, even if the space is big, you might be able to identify the density, but the way you map it to the parameter might be not one to one. So that you have to be careful. Um, it's usually the artifact of the statisticians caring about parameters, whereas the real thing is like the density. So if you if you only care about the density, usually you don't worry too much. So as long as you so you can think of the density as a parameter. If you if you think of the density as a parameter, usually you're in good shape. But whenever you try to like map it to some like lower dimensional parameter, like in regression, you want the coefficients of the covariates. Um, so a very simple example where things would break down is in regression. So 
just the comments. So you have these um, like regression model, uh, hopefully people know about regression. Um, there's an easy way, like this is still like a linear model. So you can think of the Y as having like, if you want to put it in our framework, these are going to be our parameter parametric family of the service. So I observe an observation, let's say X is fixed. Sorry, not, not, um, so the mean is um, X theta and then the variance sigma squared I. Um, it's like the parametric family is very benign. So it's uh, like a bunch of Gaussians parameterized by a binary dimensional parameter. So this is like N, let's say by D, but the model can still be non-identifiable. So I can still, a lot of trouble identifying theta, even if I can re recover the exact x theta. So if I can recover the distribution, the distribution is present one to one mapping with. So if I recover the mean, so I can, I, like, let's say if I observe y, I might be able to recover the mean and, and the variance, but even if I give you the mean, I might not recover the parameter correctly. Right, anyone? Sorry? I'm assuming x is like no, no, we assume that X is known. Theta is the unknown parameter. So it, this is a regression. So I give you Y and X. I assume that the relation is like, so this is noise. So it's like Sigma squared. So this model can be identified on theta or can be not identified on theta. So anyone can give a simple example where theta is not, yeah. Oh, if X is not full rank. Yeah, if X is not full rank, what they like, so this thing called multi collinearity happens. So some of the columns can be written as linear combination. The other columns, I can trade off. So this called like X theta could be equal to X theta prime. Um, and there's no way to identify the prime, even though the model is very simple. So this you have to take care of. So from going back from the distribution to this, there is this issue that you have to worry about. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, or uh, hopefully talk about, um, like let's say first order, or if you assume that the, the first one was the first order, this would be the second order, whatever you want to call it, like more, more information about the performance of the estimate. So suppose that the estimator is converging to the true parameter, it's consistent. Can we say more about like the error, basically. Um, and so this is uh, what usually called asymptotic normality theory. So you, you want to show that your um, the, the difference between the estimator and the true parameter properly normalized, like stabilizes, converges to somewhere, then you can like do uh, like a statistical analysis. Let's say if I know the distribution asymptotically, then I can come, come like come, um, um, construct confidence interval. So like, get an estimate of the standard deviation of the limit, which sort of you can think of it as standard error of your estimate and so on. So the first uh, law, the like main law of probability gives you consistency. The second law, which is the central limit theorem gives you these kind of results. So if you, if you write the central limit theorem from the perspective of a statistician, you usually write it like that. So the sample mean converges to the population mean that's weak law of large numbers. Now I take the difference, uh, the deviation of x bar from mu, and this is like fluctuations around the mean. And if I normalize by root n, um, and if um, the first like moment is mu, the second moment, uh, or the or the sigma is the covariance matrix. Um, so covariance matrix. So assuming that these are let's say in R D. Um, assume that the second order, like the second moments exist, then the covariance matrix is well defined. So we have sigma, then this converges to multivariate normal with mean zero and covariance sigma, covariance matrix sigma. Okay, so this sort of characterizes the fluctuation. First, it says that the fluctuations of, are the, of the order n to the negative one half. Um, if I multiply by something bigger than root n, it goes to infinity. If I multiply by something smaller than root n, it goes to zero still. So this is the right of scaling. So if I scale it like that, it converges um, to something not non-trivial. And um, it converges in distribution. So it's a different mode of conversion. So hopefully people know that it doesn't converge in probability. 
to anywhere, but in distribution, the distribution of this quantity approach as a normal. And this is very good for statisticians because then you can talk about like confidence intervals, confidence sets, like standard errors, things like that. That's why statisticians like CLT as well. Okay. Sounds good. So this is the basis. And then from this, we can like construct all other, like, like most other asymptotic normality results. In particular, I, what I want to do, hopefully sort of at least show you like the ideas, um, how you can like have a asymptotic normal theory for a general MSC. Uh, that's the plan. Okay. So before doing that, we have to like remind ourselves what conversion and distribution means. So can anyone tell me what convergence and distribution means? Uh, okay, so let's go first and then second. So what's that? Um, I'm remembering correctly, it could be the convergence of every point on the CDF and pointwise convergence for the CDF is convergence. Okay, pointwise convergence. of the CDF, CDFs. So let's say I have a CDF of, let's say Xn converges in distribution to X. Um, if this is a CDF of Xn, this converges to F for all T. Um, so first this, is this like in R or like in, R? In R, yeah. Okay, in R, so things are in R here. Um, this is sort of, Correct, um, with a caveat that this this is the case if f is continuous. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it has like this continuity. You only need this to hold so for every t. Um, let's say in I'm going to write it as in the set of continuity points of uh, CDP. Let's say continuity points of f. This is not a standard notation, but for simplicity. Okay, so this works for um, there's another way of writing this, like probably x n convert like less than or equal to t. That's the meaning of the CDF converges to probability that x less than or equal to t. Um, okay, good enough in in univariate case and sort of easy if you can calculate the CDF. So what was the uh, so the probability of x n in set A converges to the probability of x is in set A. Yeah, probability of x n in set A converges to the probability of x is in set A. A being what? A is uh, like the, all the measurable sets. Yeah, all the measures. So like, yeah. So this is given A measurable. Um, This is like tricky, just like above uh, this is sort of true but if you care about like rigor this is like you have to worry about open sets closed sets what happens at the boundary um like there are many characterizations that you can write like mean soup goes to for that it's like something else like just like like a like a big big um theorem called portmanteau i think portmanteau there are different characterizations so if you're interested, look at asymptotic statistics by Van der Waard. Um, and that would um, work around your lemma. So this need not hold for all sets, especially in RD, this is gonna be problematic. Um, the characterization that I like is, um, is slightly different. So this is true. But but there is another characterization which which generalizes well to like any space. So this is like characterization one, characterization two, a measurable and other properties, let's say open or something like that. Um, which I don't remember. Uh, but this one I remember. So this is easy to remember. Expectation of f x n converges to the expectation of f of x for all f in some class. Okay, this is very similar to the above. So if you take the class of F to be um, indicator functions of um, sets, then this would be true. But but the class that you use here need not be... Um, so for example, this holds if this is like um, um, continuous and bounded functions. 
Okay, so the class of continuous unbounded. So this like interesting because it's saying that the, the distribution, the conversion distribution is characterized by convergence of moments of certain type. Like um, what we're doing here is we're saying um, the F moments converge where F is any continuous bounded um, function. You can like change it to continuous and Lipschitz. You can also change it to other classes. So for example, if converges over like complex exponentials, that's enough. That would give you characteristic functions convergence. So conversion distribution is equivalent to convergence of characteristic functions. So by, by manipulating this class, so sufficiently enough functions, once you converge for sufficiently enough functions, then you converge distribution. Uh, this is useful because this can be generalized. So Xn could be like in some abstract space, as long as you can define continuous functions from that space that take reals, um, continuous boundedness or extends, and then you can define convergent distributions of like all sort of exotic objects. They're sort of reduced to what, what you know, but um, this view, for example, simplifies some of the arguments. So for example, if I have X and converges to X, so we have a lot of properties of conversion distribution. Uh, one of them is called continuous mapping. So for example, if Xn converges to X, then any continuous function of Xn converges to any continuous function of X. And from this characterization, it's very easy to see because if I have, for example, continuous bounded function applied to this, it would be like G O F, two of F, so it would be continuous and bounded because it's a composition of two continuous functions and the other one is bounded. So this character is, for example, immediately shows the continuous mapping here. Also shows other stuff, but these are sort of roughly what, what it means. Um, for us, what it matters like um, is, is what properties we would have. And if you know some, enough of these properties, you don't have to worry about the exact definition. You can like do kind of standard calculus on these operations and get new results. So you don't have to go from the definitions. You don't have to establish something like this. Um, just as you don't have to like when you to like compute the limits or derivatives of stuff, you don't have to go back to the definition. You can use properties. So some of the properties that I list here are the ones that we're going to use. And I'm not going to go through the proofs. Uh, I, I mentioned proof a little bit of this, but uh, we're going to use them a lot. Okay, if you're interested, you can look at uh, uh, um, as statistics by Van der Waart. Uh, he goes into details, and also Keener has some some like versions of this proven. So the first property is convergence probability implies convergence distribution, but not vice versa. The convergence and distribution is weaker. Convergence to a constant, however, in probability is equivalent to convergence to a constant in distribution. So if the limit is constant, they're equivalent. If the limit is a random variable, um, they're not. So by the way, uh, conversion distribution really talks about the distribution of these guys. There's there's no need to have them. They be linked probabilistically. So they could be defined on different space. Conversion probability, however, like you have to live in the same space. Um, but okay, so conversion probability implies conversion distribution. Conversion probability is equivalent conversion distribution in the case where the limit is constant. X and converges to X, F is continuous, then F of X and converges to F of X. This holds for all the various versions of conversion. Distribution and probability almost sure. So this holds for all of them. Continuity need not be everywhere. You just have to be continuous where this guy lives. So whatever this puts mass, so if this is a random variable that puts mass only on zero to one, and F is continuous on zero to one, but maybe discontinuous elsewhere, it's fine. So Sometimes you see that um, this criteria is mentioned like that. F only needs to be continuous on set C, such that the probability that X belongs to C is one. So um, D is very important. It's called sometimes Slutsky's theorem. Um, like the consequence usually is called Slutsky's theorem or lemma, but this is like uh, the basis for all of those results. Uh, what it says is that if one sequence converges in distribution, to some x and one other sequence converges to a constant in distribution, um, then the pair converges as a pair of random variables to the limit. Okay. Um, 
this would fail again if, and we'll see an example. If both of them are random, then this need not necessarily hold. Okay, so that's the tricky part about these. Um, however, if we have conversion probability, um, both both of the limits are random, then then the result holds. So this also shows the strength of the probability the conversion probability stronger, so it gives you more. Um, so that B does not hold if you replace the constant with some other random variable, we'll see a counter example. Um, and then the, the last piece is convergence in distribution. So if you have X and converging distribution to X, and I have another sequence uh, that's approaching Xn in the limit. So the distance of Xn and uh, Yn converges to zero, then y n has to converge in distribution to the limit. So this, this is in a probability, or if you want, in distribution doesn't matter because the limit is like constant. In that case, they're equivalent. The distance is like in, in um, the scalar cases, it's just something like that. In, in RD would be like the norm example. Okay. So the, the, like with these properties, if you like get yourself familiar with, you can do a lot. Uh, just a few basic properties you can, uh, as we'll, you will see hopefully in your problems or we'll see later. Uh, once you get comfortable, you can manipulate these expressions and you get new results. Okay. Questions? I'll let you like look at it for a bit. I'm hoping that some of it is familiar from some other course. Okay. Um, these are usually like things that are more appropriate in a probability course, but oftentimes probabilists are not interested in this. So statisticians are interested because you don't have to go to, like you can drive like new results from just CLT and, and we call them large numbers. So you, you often find these in statistics book, uh, the probability book. Like some of it you would be like the first one you find in everything, but probably see as well. But the Slutskis, for example, is what statisticians really use. So for example, if I combine B, sorry, no, C and B, okay, um, you can see what kind of interesting stuff we can show. So for example, if you have, um, uh, you, you look at these maps, so the map that maps like X and Y to X plus Y is a continuous map from R2 to R. Product is like that. The inverse is, is like that if if um, if y is non-zero. And the way I wrote it is actually works for matrices. So if x and y are matrices, y inverse times x is continuous. If these are matrices, this product, if it makes sense, is continuous. So let's suppose um, x n, y n, and x are random, are random variables or vectors or matrices, um, and c is a constant. Xn converges to x in distribution, y converges to c in distribution, then xn plus y n converges in distribution to x plus c, assuming that the dimensions of the matrices match or that scalar if you want. Xn times y n converges to cx, y n inverse times xn converges to c inverse x, assuming that c is non zero for the last one. Um, if it's a matrix, we're going to assume that it's invertible. If it's invertible, then this map. Um, would be continuous at C. More generally, this function, if any function of Xn and Yn converges to F of Xn and C, F is a continuous function. So you see that this is um, like a combination of C and D. Okay, but it's very useful. Basically, I can just replace this with the limit and this, this with the limit and the result holds. Okay. Sounds good. So, and if you remember what little OP meant, so let's see if people remember what this notation meant. This is like a statement I wrote is like a summary of one of the, like not the summary, but um, this implies what I wrote. So let's see if you guys remember what OP is and why this means. Like, Followed by corollary one. So if I have something which is OP of one, 
Another thing, which is OP of one, if I add them, the result is OP of one, yes. So are you talking about convergence? Conver not the convergence. What, what, what is this notation? Uh, P goes to zero. P goes. So it's, it's something that goes to zero in probability. So this is when I write something like statement, you would see a statement like this. So this means that it's a term, let's say xn, um, that, that's going in probability to zero. This is another term probably y n is going to zero in probability that this is equal to that means that um, sort of this is like saying x n plus y n basically goes to probably to zero so if you unpack the statement what it's saying is that if I have a sequence that converts is probably to zero and a sequence that converts is probably to zero then the sum is going to convert is probably to zero okay so the sum of two terms of the OP of one is again OP of one. So these summations, like if you're like um, familiar with O, o notation, this seems like like one plus like one plus one is one, but it's not it's not like that. So what this means is that what exactly I wrote. So the term which is all one plus the term which is all one is again all one means that if this goes to zero and if this goes to zero, the addition is also like okay, so this helps, so this follows from that. Uh, let you think a little bit why this follows from that, but this allows me to like simplify a lot of the arguments instead of writing like um, a lot of terms that you, you don't want to name them and they're going to zero. You can just like play a little bit, write little OP of one, and then another term comes in, it's also a little OP of one. You add them, it's still OP of one. So I'm going to do this in the argument that we're, we're going to see uh, and basically shove things under the rug using this, okay. Um, so why this is like a consequence of that? Well, since those are in probability approaching the constant, that makes in distribution, they're also approaching. Okay, right. so that's, that's the key point. So then you have the conversion probability to a constant. I can just as well say this conversion distribution. And then this is an instance of it. So x n conversion is average to zero, y n conversion is average to zero, then x n plus y n conversion is average to zero plus zero to zero. Okay, so that's an application. So a okay. special case of Slutsky. The above, since let's say x n converging in probability to zero is equivalent to x and converging distribution to zero. So that's basically this property B combined with this corollary. And the convention regarding the OP notation and what it means is that to write like OP01 plus OP01. So if you're not, if you're not comfortable, like having seen these, this might take a while to get used to. Like writing like Two plus two is two. It's like like that, but it's it's really not not like that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so slowly move on, like to uh, the counter example. So counter example. Oh, so first a simple example. So x n conversion distribution to zero, not no, zero. So z is a non-trivial random variable. So um, to to a random variable that that has normal zero one distribution. Sometimes you'd see that people write um, X and converging distribution to normal zero one because really the distribution is of the limit is what matters. So sometimes you see people write a variable, sometimes the distribution, they're sort of equivalent because um, what really matters is the distribution of the limit, nothing else. So let's say X and converging distribution to Z, normal zero one, then X and squared conversion distribution to z squared and z squared has chi squared one distribution by definition so why is that true yeah so continuous mapping theorem great simple example but you can see it can get like non-trivial limit not all normal limits you can get like other distributions because like nonlinear distributions sort of leave you like move you outside the gaussian um, counter example. So X is uniform zero one. And I, have, I construct a sequence that's equal to X for every N. Okay, so X N is equal to a single random variable and that random variable has a uniform 
the O1 distribution, and then I construct another sequence, which is equal to xn if n is odd, and equal to 1 minus um, xn if n is even. Okay, so this is just a compact way. I'm not sure if it's more compact. So it's just another way of writing I wrote next. The flip state between xn and 1 minus xn. Uh, so it really flips between, um, you imagine, because xn is constant, it really flips between x and 1 minus x. Okay. Um, so let me not show you the conclusion here. So here, xn converges to x in distribution, right? Um, obviously, because all of them are having the same distribution in x, they're actually equal to x. And x and y and also converge in distribution to x. That might be slightly more, um, not more difficult, but it, it takes a bit to, to justify it. But then x and y and does not converge in distribution to anything. So that's, that's what we want to so first, why why is it related in solution to x? Basically, why in conversion solution to uniform zero ones? Why is x n or one minus x n really it's x or one minus x because x n is equal to x? Sorry? Is it for all n from Why? It is true. It's by y. So one minus uniform distribution is zero. Yeah, so x is uniform zero one. One minus x has uniform distribution zero one, right? Like symmetric. So and then x also has uniform zero one distribution. So y n has uniform zero distribution no matter what n is. So distribution is constant, so it has to converge to. So we have this case, but then the result is saying, or that the claim is that the pair does not converge anywhere in the distribution. So what is the distribution of this? You guys can. What is it doing as n varies? So for n odd and even, you can consider it and, and see what it does. Is it sort of like oscillating? Like going yes. back and forth because y is always like, it's either x or one minus x for a reason. So yeah, it's like, it's not, right? If it is odd, so that's just y plus x. If n is given, that's just x plus y is one. So so that that is not any distribution. Either. Yeah, so these are all very close to the thing. So if you want to describe the distribution of the sequence. It also links between two distributions. If n is odd, this pair is going to be exactly x and x. Okay, so it's going to be on the line, which is like 45 degrees. And x is uniform, so it would be uniform distribution on this piece. Okay. If x is even, then um, this pair would be x and 1 minus x. So it's going to be always on, on this line. And because x is uniform, you can like convince yourself that it's going to be uniformly distributed on, on this. So this pair, this, the distribution of it oscillates between these two uniform distributions, neither of which has like a density respect to the back measure, but they're well-defined distributions. Okay, so oscillates in these two, as so I can't converge to a limit because the distribution is one thing for, and even one thing for the odd, even, like odd case. Uh, there's no way that there's there's a single distribution that in the limit. It's like the sequence minus one to the n, right? It's oscillates between minus one and one. This is like the distribution version. It's good to have this in mind um, as the like the corner case where Slutsky sort of fails if, if both are random. Really. Sounds good. Okay, um, questions? So here's an example where things work. Um, 
uh, you have an IAD sequence. Um, the expectation of that distribution is mu, the, the variance is sigma squared. Um, I form the sample mean, and then I form the sample variance. So if you're taking any statistics course, these two should look familiar. That's the sample mean and sample variance. Sometimes you see n minus one here um, because we care about asymptotics, that doesn't matter. So, um, and you can also write this as a sample second moment minus the sample mean squared. So this is, um, this is like the empirical, the variance of the empirical distribution. And so it satisfies, this is saying like, Variance is, um, let's, let's call this expectation hat if you want, under the, the um, uh, empirical distribution of x, so x minus uh, this, um, this is saying expectation hat of x squared minus, because empirical distribution is a valid distribution, this has to hold. That's, that's another reason why I put a one over m there. This is um, formula holds. And next we show, or oh, we want to show that if I subtract the mean, divide by, um, so we know that the standard deviation of this, or the variance of this, uh, yeah, root variance, standard deviation is going to be sigma over root n, right? And so an approximate an estimate of this would be like Sn divided by root n. So something called standard error. So this this is this is what I'm going to divide by. Okay. So again, if you've seen like any basic statistics, this looks familiar. This is called the T statistic, and it's often used to to construct confidence intervals and tests things like that. Um, under the Gaussianity assumption, if if the underlying distribution is Gaussian, this this is going to have an exactly a T distribution. With n minus. Um, yeah, if you divide by n minus one, it's actually going to have a um, what we're going to show is that asymptotic this, this is going to converge to a normal distribution, no matter what the underlying distribution is. And you can use the techniques that we use to show that this key statistic conversion distribution is normal. So let's see how that works. And that would be a, like a distribution free result. So it's saying no matter what the underlying distribution is, um, I get that asymptotically, this is approximately normal. So you can use this. Um, this is sometimes called a pivot. This distribution does not depend on the parameters. So you can use it to construct you. Like as it's an asymptotic pivot. So asymptotically, it doesn't depend on um, the parameters, unknown parameters. So you can use it to construct confidence intervals when we will see something like that later. Um, so how do you show this? Let's, let's use the techniques that, that uh, or the properties that we described. So the first thing to note, I'm gonna look at this and try to figure out what the limit of this is. So this is, I've written it as the alternative form. So uh, one over n some i from one to n x i squared minus x bar squared. So can I con conclude that this converges to a limit? Does this have a limit? Using the properties. That we... So we know CLT, we know weak law, large numbers, and those properties, continuous mapping theorem, Slutsky's lemma, stuff like that. So does this one converge to anything? Things are IID, right? Second moment exists. And verges in probably to the expectation of one of them, which is that, right? Squared, right? No, this doesn't require continuous mapping. Okay. What is it's a weak law? Weak law, yeah. So this is weak law of large numbers because this is like some y, i, their iid, right? It's an average. So by weak law of large numbers, this converges, right? So this is going to be um, the mean squared plus the variance squared. Right? 
that's the kind of assumptions that I put here. So how about the second one? So we know that the sample mean converges in probability to mu. Um, what can I say about this guy? Mu squared. Okay, this is continuous mapping, so that's good, right? So then, given these, what can I say about SN? Yeah, a little bit more details. So it converges to the limit of the first one, which is this, minus the limit of the second one, which is that, which turns out to be a sigma squared. So why this is true? That's the probability approach. Yes. So the mean distribution is the approach that you do slut keys. Yes. So they like a the, the key is like a slut case theorem. Because both of these limits are constant. There are also distributions, like distribution limits. So this conversion distribution to that, this is the other one, and this conversion distribution to that, and um, SM squared is the summation of both, like additional both. So we're using basically this part. Where like the, the limit of the first one is also constant. So XM converges to C1, YM converges to C2, then the sum has to converge to C1 plus C2. So good, we have like a result. We can say probability. We can also put distribution. It doesn't matter here, um, right? Like this um, point because the limit is constant either one. So that's good. So what I have now. So okay. So I have x bar. Um, this is in the numerator. So what can I say about? Um, let's see, like, what can I say about this guy? If I divide this by, um, so, so, okay, so let's do this. Um, so what I have this, what I have is something like this, right? Um, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to multiply by this and divide by the same thing. Okay, now this part, I can say something about, okay. What does this do? And zero one by CLT. Yes, converges to normal zero one by just regular CLT. That's basically the sort of classical CLT. Uh, how about this term? So the, these guys cancel, right? This cancel. So what can I say about sigma over Sn? Converges to one, let's say in probability or distribution y. One over Sn is, oh yeah, I guess it is continuous mapping. It's all continuous mapping all the way down. Okay, so this is, so like Sn converges, right, um, to, um, sigma squared, right? And then the map, which like, if you define this map, which is sigma divided by x, right? This is continuous at every point, which is non-zero, right? You're assuming the sigma squared is non-zero, by the way. Um, so f of Sn is going to converge to uh, f of sigma squared. Uh, I should say root. Um, root SN squared converges to sigma. Um, so let's say I know that SN squared converges to sigma squared. Right? I'll define this function. The, so that is what is established above. Right? I'm going like, to include like, everything, like taking square root, in, like inversion, everything. Like, together, this function is continuous on let's say negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. Okay, and um, and applying to this, it would be like, this this thing is gonna be Sn, i sorry, this would be sigma divided by root Sn squared, which is Sn, this converges to sigma divided by root sigma squared, right? Which is saying sigma by root Sn converges, sorry, by Sn converges to, 
one. So this could be in probability or in distribution. Okay, so that holds by continuous mapping theorem. So this converges to improbability to one. So what can I conclude about the product? Converge to normal zero one in distribution, why? That's the slot scheme, yeah. You can see like combination of CLP, continuous mapping care of Slutsky give you a lot of information. So th this is a sequence, a random error that converges to a constant. The other sequence converges to a non-constant limit, but that's fine. You can now apply the Slutsky. This is like saying um, XN, like, so you're using here this version, XN converges to X in distribution, YN converges to C in distribution and X and Y and converges to C times X in distribution, C being one here. Okay. So that's the result that we wanted. So that's the statistic that we had and this conversion distribution to normal zero. Okay. So the advantage is that we replace the, the unknown variance with this. And that, that's how people construct the TS statistic. Now, the un, only unknown is mu, let's say, and I can use this to construct confidence interval for mu asymptotically, because asymptotically, what this is saying is um, the probability that this is less than or equal to, like the absolute value is less than or equal to T um, converges to probability that a normal, sort of normal is in, like absolute value is less than T. And I know what that is. So I can, I can build confidence bands for mu. <clears throat> Sounds good. So this result, the result, the result does not require the underlying distribution to be Gaussian, it just relies on the CLT and the properties that we established. Good. Okay. Now, one, like maybe two, one more or two more concepts. So in, or, in order to like establish asymptotic normality of M estimators, we also need a, like the idea of a bounded sequence. So we have sequences that converge to zero. We also need like bounded sequences from like analysis. So the equivalent of boundedness is this kind of um, concept of a uniform tightness or bounded improbability. Same name, sort of different, different people use different names. So either you say a sequence is uniformly tight or a sequence is bounded in probability, if this technical condition holds, which is sort of like saying the sequence is bounded, it might not converge to anywhere, but it's not like blowing up to infinity. So the formal definition is for every epsilon, there exists an M such that uh, if you look at the probability that um, the norm of X is bigger than M, the supremum over N is less than epsilon. So uniform is this part. So you can choose this M, one M that works for all N in the sequence. And so, so what it means, if, if you think of the univariate case, this is just gonna be that. So what it's saying is that pick any epsilon that you want, I can choose an M um, such that if you look at this interval, uh, the mass um, that these distributions put um, as n varies is going to be like bounded, like bound, bounded by epsilon, uh, no matter what n is. So, um, so this is really a statement about the distribution of xn's, not the xn's themselves. So um, if you look at, for example, x1, it might be something like that. Um, x2 might be this, 3 might be that. Like, as n goes to infinity, these are not gonna start moving like to the infinity, okay? So they're gonna be bounded. They have to like, they, they, their tails have to like be less than epsilon. So they, they're like, it's restricted to this sort of bound. So they can't put mass bigger than epsilon outside. So the case that this prevents is that if I have a sequence of distributions um, that start here and just uh, maybe like just shift it, start moving towards the infinity. 
Okay, I don't want the mass to shift to infinity. I just want it to be nicely concentrated, like contained, not concentrated, but contained within like a ball near zero. So that's the notion of like probabilistic boundedness. They're not converging anywhere, so you can just jump around, but they're not allowed to like put mass that sort of starts to move to infinity. Okay, that's the, the uniformity means that I can put this bound that works for all these conservatives in the sequence. Okay. Um, so that's tightness. A single random variable you can prove that is tight. So for every, like if there was this one, for every epsilon there is an epsilon that this is bounded. So the mass can't be at infinity. This is true for like finite dimensional objects. If you think about like Bonnock space of so some functional analysis people used to be in class. So I guess uh, those like even the tightness might fail. So you could have objects that uh, not necessarily tight, but for like real value random variables, this, any real random variable is tight. Uh, so this is saying that they're uniformly tight. Together they're tight. Um, so like for all intended purposes, you can think of these sequences of random variables as bounded, right? Bounded sequences versus sequences that convert to zero. The next one is OP of one. Like you write like big OP of one to to denote the sequence that's uniformly bounded. If you know like what big O is, big O is boundedness, usual boundedness. So you put the little P here. So the, the main um, two results that you need to remember about uniform tightness is that if you have a sequence that converges to zero, and the sequence is uniformly tight, then the product is going to converge to zero probably. So if you think about it, like usual sequences, this makes a lot of sense. You have know, a sequence that goes to zero, a sequence that's bounded, the product has to be bound, that goes to zero. Um, this one, right, like this, this. So the first one, no OP of one times big OP of one is all OP of one. Okay. Um, the second one is that if something converges in distribution, uh, then it has to be uniformly tight. Again, it's like if you see that picture, it's sort of reasonable because like uniform tightness is like weaker than convergence in distribution. So if, if things are converged, distribution converging somewhere is going to be contained because the single distribution is tight. Um, so that should be sort of obvious. Although like proving it might make it a bit better. Sounds good. Uniform tightness measures nicely with convergence and probability to zero and convergence distribution. That's that's the relation to convergence and probability and convergence and distribution. Questions? Yes. Is it convergence along distribution along the substitutes equivalent to uniform tightness? Uh it's all allowed. Convergence. Can you say that again? So I think convergence in distribution along a subsequence is equivalent to being probably in this. Sort of, I guess it's true. I forgot the exact statement, but what you're saying is sort of um, it's like if you have a compact sequence, there is a convergence subsequent, right? So this is roughly saying something like that. You're right. So if the sequence is uniformly high. And there is a subsequence to conversion distribution. I believe this is correct, but just double check. Right? It's it's sort of like that. Sounds good. Um, so this one, um, I usually debate or not usually to to talk about, but I'm going to mention it. Not some, not all people like it. It's like a little bit too technical, but I'm just going to mention it and tell you where it's used. Um, uh, you can check out from now until we like leave this part. But this is the, the only other notion that's interesting that we use, um, uh, that you, you need sort of to prove the result that I want like in, in one way or another. So this is the idea of stochastically equicontinuous sequences of functions. So it's a little bit technical because it, it's a property of a sequence of functions and it's a property of a sequence of random functions. So um, equicontinuity actually came up. That's why I'm like more confident talking about this. Because, uh, I guess you mentioned like equicontinuity. So maybe let me like start with that. So what is an equicontinuous? So, so I think it's not 
for the conditions is saying like you know, this just epsilon delta definition of community. Yes. If you have a sequence of functions, you can choose that delta independent of your function. Great. It's a single delta that looks for all the functions. Great. So this is exactly what it is. So so let's say for the heuristic class of functions, we say that f is equal to continuous at theta naught if for every epsilon there exists a delta such that if theta is close to theta naught delta close, then the values of the functions are. Uh, Epsilon close, like f theta is close to f theta naught. Um, and this 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 holds for all functions there. So if you ignore this, this is just the finished continuity of the function. Uh, what this is saying is that for every epsilon, I can choose a single delta. There is a delta that if I like restrict my neighborhood. So it's saying like if the usual epsilon delta definition of the continuity is saying. If you have a theta naught here in the domain, if you put a ball, like um, if I want to like be like this is f theta naught, if I want to be epsilon close, um, so there's this ball of radius epsilon. Uh, yeah, this good. Um, so let's say I want to put a ball of radius epsilon. Um, so let's say this is a ball, just accept this as a ball. So ball of radius epsilon, I want to say that f of theta, so f of theta is close to f theta. So it's in this ball. Um, so f is continuous if I can pick for every epsilon, I can put it like a delta. Pick a delta here, uh, such that if, if theta is there, um, so theta is there, and this is the radius is delta. If theta is in, oh, okay, I guess I lost the, Oh, okay, coming back. So if, if theta is, um, so for every epsilon neighborhood of a theta naught, there is just a delta such that if delta theta is in that neighborhood, then f theta would be here. Um, equicontinuity means that for every epsilon, I can choose this delta, the single delta, that, such that all these functions, so this is one of them, the other one, um, it's not like f theta, it's going to be a different f, but like all of them, it works for all of them at, all, at the same time. So there's another one, which is like F prime, for example. Like if we are looking at the class of functions, um, it's still like looking at an epsilon neighborhood. So for, for all these functions, you're looking at epsilon neighborhood that's corresponding. Um, um, like value at theta naught. And so the single delta there works for all of them. We guarantee that the values of F the corresponding f lies within the neighborhood of the corresponding theta naught. Um, just a, like a conceptually simple idea. It's like uniform continuity, but it's not for a single function. It's like uniform across functions, not across the domain. Sounds good? So that's, it's like a property of class of functions. Um, so what is, uh, so if you manipulate this definition, so this is saying, this is the usual definition of equal continuity. If you manipulate it a little bit, you can write it like that. So for every epsilon, there is delta such that supremum over f, supremum over the ball um, of this deviation is less than epsilon. Okay, that's another way of doing it. So it's saying that this deviation, if I look at it, take the supremum over this ball, um, over theta, and then over f, this uniformity usually involves supremum. So that, that's what it is. Um, if I want to like write it another way, um, I can put a probability here in the soup out. The probability that this holds and the soup outside is zero. So this is true because things are deterministic. So the probability of it um, is the same as if I remove the probability. Of so if this, uh, so sorry, this, um, so, so I can say that this, um, this is a complement of this. Okay. The complement having probability zero means this calls a probability one. Okay. So this is the deterministic case. So this works. Um, so that's like equicontinuity. Yeah, yeah. I even stronger. Is that almost everywhere? No, no. This, at this point, everything is deterministic. I'm just rewriting the the C, like the class of functions is deterministic. Okay. Um, what I want to like use this is to like state this version, which is um, once you understand that, then you'd say, um, okay, I can just upgrade this. I don't need to be exactly zero. Um, I just want 
this to be like less than epsilon. Um, but then the class of function is also like stochastic. So you end up with this definition. This is for not for a general class, but for a sequence. So you have a sequence of functions. It's it's called a stochastically equally continuous if um, now we have an like an extra slack parameter eta here, which controls the probability. So for every delta, for every eta, and every epsilon, there is a delta such that this horrible statement holds. Okay. Um, so this is saying that all of this is true, but like sort of like in probability. Like there's a slack with some probability. I don't need to this to be exactly zero. I can let some slack here. Okay, so I can leave some slack. And um, so that's basically the state. Yeah. So is this, it's like, it's sort of like a uniform version, but it seems like it's more like pointerized, pointwise, right? Because we almost say it's just like, it's, 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 it's uniform. Point. No, it's, yeah, it's uniform across the class of functions. That's the idea. Not in the domain, yeah. So it's like so you have two dimensions, theta and then f. So it's uniform across f versus uniform across theta. It's like at the point theta not, but uniform across the functions. Yeah. yeah. Is it simple saying that at that point, like none of those functions blow up? Um, Is it doing anything? Not blow up. It's just they're close to the true, like the, the it's the continuity statement. So if you if you're in a neighborhood of theta, like theta not, yeah. All of them are going to be close to their value of theta naught. And for them to like, for you to have a guarantee that they're within epsilon of their value of theta naught, the, the, the input domain delta that you need to take is, is just the same for all of them. Yeah. You don't have to vary this. Um, it's fairly technical. So, this statement is I borrowed from this, this book, Convergence of Stochastic Process by David Pollard. This is a nice uh, a classic book that talks about. Um, Empirical process theory, and um, just from there, um, you can extend it to like. So you can see that it's um, this version that I wrote. Um, I think I lost again from the connection. Let's see, yeah, this version we can't even put like f outside because f. Well, actually, f is fine. F is f is like sort of a class of functions, but for us, um, um, you're looking at like a sequence of random functions. So. This definition for a sequence is good enough. So, so um, the, the 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 what I care about is the consequences of it, not the definition. So, the if if you have something like this, if you have a class of functions that are is stochastically continuous, equally continuous, how to show it is a different story. So, if you care about like showing it, you can solve that. But if you have a, a class of functions that have this property, there is there is a very good thing that happens, and this is this result. So. Um, if you have a sequence which is stochastically equally continuous at theta naught, and then you have another sequence that converges in probability to theta naught, then I apply these, these functions like to these sequences. So the functions are random. Each one is applied to the corresponding element in that sequence, and this converges, like the difference of this and f and theta naught converges to zero probability. So I can like, replace this with theta naught, and so that, that's really helpful. So this is powerful because this is very hard to like characterize in general. Because like Fn, for example, we'll see. Fn could depend, like theta hat n could be like the maximizers or minimizer of Fn. And it could depend. So this could be highly dependent. Right? dependent. So this, is, this allows me to replace this with the limit. And this conversion probably could be zero. So later on, I can work with this instead of that. This you can actually show. It could be a homework problem. I can post it and you can try it if you want. Um, it's easy actually to show if you not not that easy, but like fairly easy if you if you follow the definition. Um, there's another sort of um, sufficient thing. I'll post that. It's not part of your homework problem, but there's also another result that gives you sufficient conditions for this, actually, in, in the case where um, Fn. Is like mn, so this is this can be written as. Um, suppose I can write things as um, so we care about things like this, one over n summation i from one to and remember we are, we're looking at these objects for classes of functions that look like this. Um, uh, then there are easy criteria for equivalent, not easy but sort of. Um, okay, so we're almost done like with, with the time. So what I'm going to do next, uh, just just reminder, uh, next time I'm going to come back and then try to prove this result. 
And it would help if you take a look ahead of the time, but this is establishing as a starting normality for an estimator. And you can see like there is this equal continuity here of the second derivative of that edge. And the other conditions are also interesting, but the proof is sort of straightforward once you like assume these. So how to establish, for example, this is slightly tricky, but um, but given this, then you can use like combination CLTs, the continuous mapping key and spots key to prove a nice um, adenotic normality results for this general class of MSD. Okay, any questions? Thank you guys. See you next time.